You know, we need a, a little bit of history, at least going back uh, uh, two centuries to understand where we are right now. Um, starting at actually five centuries ago, when uh, Vasco da Gama uh, voyaged from Europe to Asia, uh, and uh, when uh, Columbus uh, voyaged westward and uh, discovered for the Europeans uh, this new uh, American continent, uh, the world changed decisively. Right. It was the period in which the West, so-called, really meaning uh, the countries of the North Atlantic region, uh, began their imperial pursuits, uh, that is, uh, trans-ocean conquest uh, and trans-ocean uh, uh, enterprise, actually, uh, of course, uh, uh, Indonesia fell to the Dutch uh, and uh, um, became uh, Batavia, became a part of uh, the beginnings of global capitalism with the Dutch East Indies Company. Uh, and uh, Britain uh, began what would be an ascent to global empire with the uh, British uh, East India uh, Company uh, founded around 1600. And uh, this began global capitalism and European imperial uh, domination. Of course, it was a very gradual process, nothing absolutely decisive, but uh, things uh, really accelerated in the 19th century with industrialization, which came first to Britain uh, and then spread to the US and the rest of Western Europe. Uh, and with industrialization, which was essentially a breakthrough of steam power and mechanization, the uh, economic and military power of Europe was not only strong, but became utterly predominant. Uh, and so it's in the 19th century that you have uh, the uh, British Empire, it was sometimes called Pax Britannica, but it was the opposite of Pax, the opposite of peace. It was war just about everywhere, wars of conquest, rebellions, crushing rebellions. Uh, the Dutch uh, played a role, and the United States increasingly played a role. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, Japan became the first industrial power of Asia, and it joined the imperialist club right away. Uh, grabbing uh, colonies in uh, Taiwan uh, and Korea, uh, defeating uh, first China, then Russia in war. But all of this uh, I emphasize because by the beginning of the 20th century, it was really a, a Western-led world. Uh, Britain was still predominant institutionally, culturally, on the Navy, uh, on the oceans, um, and uh, the British Empire was empire number one. Uh, then came the French, the Germans, the Dutch, uh, the Spanish and Portuguese still had some empires in the United States, and Japan were the new budding imperial powers. Two world wars uh, essentially drew an end to the European imperial age, but greatly empowered the United States and also greatly empowered uh, in a complex process, uh, Russia, uh, in the form of the Soviet Union. Um, but what was really uh, decisive at the end of World War II and the end of the European imperial age was that countries became independent, uh, Indonesia, uh, India, um, Indochina after prolonged war, and so on, Africa in the 1950s and 1960s. And while every post-colonial history is very complicated, typically quite violent, lots of instability, uh, it was the beginning of a big rebalancing of the world economy. Because what happened under the British and essentially Western imperialism was a complete predominance of Western power, literacy, and technology. And the rest of the world was essentially picking up the pieces, uh, exploited for raw materials, very low education, 
very high illiteracy, uh, and the imperial powers had no interest in doing anything about that. That was not an era of development. It was an era of exploitation. So starting with independence, countries began the process of catching up, and they began the process of especially literacy and mass education. This is the single most important step of economic development. In 1950, the literate world was basically the Western world. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but it was incredibly concentrated in the Western world. By 2000, that had ended. Primary education was everywhere. Literacy was extensive. The spread of technology was arriving everywhere. And there was a fundamental rebalancing of the world economic system. So it was no longer a Western system. It was increasingly a world system. Now, that is all the backdrop to geopolitics, because in 1945, what had been the British imperial system became the American imperial system. Uh, America didn't conquer territory exactly the same way. Its mode of op operation was to overthrow governments. Uh, so it put client states uh, everywhere uh, that it could. Uh, the U.S. Mm. engaged just between 1947 and 1989 in 70 regime change operations, according to one right. recent study, 64 of them, by the way, covert. Uh, this was the era of the CIA formed in 1947. And it, the CIA essentially was and still is to a large extent, a secret army of the president of the United States uh, that can be deployed to overthrow governments abroad. And so the U.S. was the imperial power. Uh, it did some good things for the world. It didn't block economic development. It was a relatively open international system, uh, except for the Soviet part of it. But uh, it was very much a U.S.-led system. Uh, and uh, when the U.S. didn't like what another country was doing, it would overthrow the government as it did in countless countries. And usually uh, it would do so uh, covertly, let's say, even though everybody knew uh, what happened. So that had a special character because the U.S. would deny the obvious. Uh, the new government would be a kind of puppet regime attacked internally for being a puppet regime of the U.S. But the U.S., no, we had nothing to do with it. Uh, it's not us. And so it really also poisoned politics in many places in the world. Uh, now, that uh, continued, uh, but had a uh, marked change after 1991, because the Soviet Union, the great foe of the United States, uh, disappeared from the map. Uh, the U.S. seemed to be the unipolar power. Uh, the U.S. Uh, actually accelerated its regime change operations uh, just about everywhere that it could. There was more overthrow of governments, not less with the end of the Soviet Union, because the U.S. said, OK, now we can clean up everywhere. It's our world. But of course, the rebalancing of the world economy actually accelerated. And the most important dimension of that was the rise of China. Mm -hmm. Uh, which the U.S. Uh, completely uh, missed the, the point and couldn't understand what was happening. But nothing special was happening except China was making up for lost time uh, after having been bludgeoned for 100 years from the Opium Wars until right. independence in 1949 with the People's Republic of China. Uh, China made up for lost time uh, and uh, accelerated its technological, educational, institutional, infrastructural development quite brilliantly, by the way, uh, and um, became a, a, a major power. So all of that history lesson is just to say that um, we had, after 1950, a U.S.-led world, but an underlying rebalancing of the world economy, which spread technology, know-how, 
literacy, education, skills all over the world. And by now, we are in an economy that is absolutely multipolar. Uh, the U.S. doesn't dominate at all economically. Technology is quite sophisticated in many places in the world, though the U.S. has still some leadership in some areas. It's by no means uh, what the U.S. thinks it is because right. China is extremely sophisticated, as are many places in the world. But uh, the U.S. Uh, hasn't understood in foreign policy terms that that so-called unipolar world has ended because of the underlying economic rebalancing. And so we have a lot of geopolitical tension that comes from the fact that we're entering a multipolar world, but we still don't have the understanding, the kind of cultural uh, reality between the U.S. and other countries, notably China, right. or the institutional reforms globally of U.S. institutions or U.S.-led institutions becoming truly global institutions. So these days, we're really seeing a geopolitical change. That's the rise of the BRICS. That's the Ukraine war. That's the war in the Middle East. This is really a, a set of, you could think of them as almost like plate tectonics, shifting uh, geopolitics because of the deep underlying economic and technological shifts that are underway. That's that's a fascinating answer. I, I, I would make the argument that we in Southeast Asia are much more used to multipolarity. And I would make the argument that many parts of the world beyond Southeast Asia are a lot more used to multipolarity than I would argue the United States, which seems to be struggling in embracing multipolarity, right? And I want, I want to tail this to the context of diplomacy, which you've made reference to. Diplomacy seems to be a tool that many parts of the world are not using anymore as much as we used to, right? And, and I want to build that in a context of what we're witnessing in Ukraine and what we're what we're witnessing in Gaza or West Asia. Talk about that. Well, you know, uh, geopolitics has a lot of uh, culture, political culture in it, statecraft culture in it. Uh, and uh, the United States and Britain have their own distinctive political cultures uh, that are changing themselves, of course, but should be understood. Both the Britain and the U.S. were formed as evangelical Protestant societies. Uh, that means they had a self-image of evangelizing the world, uh, saving the rest of the world. Uh, and so uh, the British Empire, uh, as it was exploiting the rest of the world, said it was civilizing the rest of the world. It was the white man's burden, uh, is the famous expression, to save the rest of the world. And the United States has a lot of that Christian evangelical spirit as well. And it's a very distinctive uh, kind of culture because uh, remember that uh, British uh, colonists uh, Puritans came right. to the East Coast of the United States uh, at a time when it was basically, uh, of course, uh, a continent of native uh, uh, Amerindian populations. This wasn't an empty place. Uh, and uh, during the roughly 300 years uh, period, uh, this uh, white Christian evangelical group ended up conquering North America in a kind of uh, crusade uh, or series of crusades. Right. Uh, and in the middle of the 19th century, it was called Manifest Destiny, destiny. that this was uh, a, a, a religious destiny of white people to rule over North America. And there was definitely always a strong racial component to uh, the imperial uh, 
transoceanic rule as well. So it wasn't just that Britain uh, and the United States got to the steam engine first. They really believed in a mission of, uh, you know, civilization. Of course, the French had their own uh, civilatrice uh, that we are civilizing the world. And there's uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, grotesque uh, uh, pseudoscience uh, in the late 19th century that followed uh, Darwin, but in a pseudoscientific way of race superiority, which turned into Nazism in its uh, most uh, extreme variant. But that was also part of the idea that Europe was destined to right. rule the world. Now, the United States is uh, geographically separated by two large oceans from the rest of the world. Uh, geography, global geography is not exactly the strong suit of the United States. I don't think that one in a hundred Americans could point to Indonesia on the map, uh, probably. Uh, and um, because we're between two very large oceans. And so... When you combine uh, several things, uh, the U.S. is having a hard time. First, the U.S. was absolutely dominant economically uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, it was the only place still standing. Uh, and the war had been phenomenal for the U.S. economy. Right. Uh, the U.S. had one day of uh, direct war. That was December 7, 1941, when Japan uh, attacked the naval base at Pearl Harbor. Other than that, the United States was unscathed in its territory, built up incredible industry, had one scientific breakthrough after another, radar and uh, rocketry and uh, so many other things, uh, and, and uh, semiconductors uh, that would become the basis of the next uh, generation of technological right. breakthroughs and so forth. So first, there was the U.S. dominance. Uh, there was the geopolitical dominance. Uh, there was the evangelical spirit that, of course, the U.S. Yes. runs the world. Who else? Uh, we're, uh, we're out to save the world. That's a deeply believed view. Weird, but really wow. believed. And there's a lot of ignorance <laughs> because, you know, I can tell you growing up in uh, Detroit, Michigan, I didn't learn a lot of global history or global geography. It took me a, a lifetime to learn uh, uh, what I know and only in part by traveling the world almost nonstop for the last 40 years, uh, because it doesn't come naturally to someone in middle America. So when you put all those pieces together, uh, the U.S. has this sense, even Biden expressed it. Of course, he's an old man, decades out of uh, tune with reality, in my opinion. But he said, we're the indispensable country. The whole world looks to us for leadership. Huh? Uh, you know, I travel the world. Does the world look to the U.S. for leadership? No. Yeah. The world looks to the U.S. for, please, be normal. Stop your wars. Don't overthrow us. Cooperate. Keep your trade open. Not for your saving us. Uh, but, you know, in the American mentality, there is still this idea uh, that uh, the U.S. is the leader and it's going to save the world. So there's a lot of culture in this. By the way, there's a lot of culture everywhere uh, in politics. Uh, if you look at Russian politics, you see a lot of Russian culture that's centuries old. If you look at Chinese statecraft, you sure. see statecraft that was formed over 2,000 years. It's not something... This is fascinating for me because right. technology changes very fast, but cultural ideas are really deeply embedded and don't change so fast and are not well understood across uh, international boundaries. Now, you ask, therefore, about diplomacy. The U.S. is just bad at it. Diplomacy for the U.S. is uh, will tell you what to do. And, and even when the U.S. is so far from being able to tell anyone what to do, the mentality is still that.
And so I just think American diplomats are rude, first right. of all, because, you know, I've learned in 40 years something about dealing with other uh, societies. Respect is a very key part of that. But the American approach is not respect. Uh, the American approach is uh, here are 10 things you need to do. Now, with a small country, that can still sometimes work, although even not so often. But with China, are you kidding? Right. Uh, you know, to be rude to China, you think you're going to get something positive out of being rude and tough to China? And uh, yet that's the American approach. So oh, yeah. America's extremely weak at diplomacy right now. Right. Uh, I would start with a course in etiquette, frankly. Uh, I would start with a course in good manners, uh, which uh, the U.S. really needs. I've worked with three secretaries generals of the UN. That's a very tough job. But uh, the first rule of that job is be polite. Uh, right. You've got 193 countries uh, that you have to respond to. And everyone from the tiniest to the largest expects respect. Yeah. So this is the first thing I would try to teach American diplomats.